All right, good afternoon and uh, welcome to our third knowledge series, everybody. Thank you for making time. So this is our brief content for today. You can browse through. So today's focus will be centered on hypertrophy. So how do you bulk while still making sure you control, you don't want to gain as much fats when you bulk? So the first thing you want to look at is your weight gain guidelines. So to ensure that you are bulking and gaining mostly muscle and not the excess of fats, you want to keep the rate of weight gain at 0.25 to 0.5% of your body weight per week. This will likely be the best under most circumstances. So this will allow mm, most of your weight gain to be favorable and we, we don't get as much uh, fat uh, gain during your gain phase. So how long should you stay in this phase? Ideally, the range will be 6 to 16 weeks. So about 1.5 months to about 4 months. And uh, this will have the fewest uh, potential downsides. The minimum will be 3 weeks. Anything shorter than that, you wouldn't make any gains or you, you have a risk of putting on a lot of fats. And the upper end for most people will be about 12 to 16 weeks. There will be some um, other considerations to take note. For a beginner, this can go up to even 24 weeks. So which is a good six months. Uh, because obviously, beginner will have beginner gains. And that phase can last even longer. So what are the limits that you want to have in each uh, phase gain? So... Let's say for a single phase, it can be something like 10 weeks, it can be something like 12 weeks, 16 weeks, so on and so forth. So we're looking at about 10% body weight for beginners to intermediate. For advanced lifters to be something like 5%. So advanced lifters will refer to people who do not make much gains in terms of their strength or in terms of their um, basically how strong they get and uh, their progression in terms of different exercises. So this will be deemed as your advanced lifter. So anybody who's new to resistance training will fall under beginners. But for myself, since I was doing a strength phase for basically all my life, so for me, I will consider myself when I uh, first went into like hypertrophy training to fall under somewhere like a beginner to intermediate. So that's why I could see a lot of gains in that period. So we will look at a minimum of 3% body weight as anything less than that, you wouldn't be motivated because you wouldn't be seeing much gains. It's anything less than that also will not alter your muscle settling point and you wouldn't see much difference. And you wouldn't know whether that is water, whether that's even muscle. It might even be fats. So with that, I'm going to share an example. So if let's say a beginner started on 1st of January and we're looking at an end date of 31st March, so that's a good um, 12 weeks or 3 months. And this person has a body weight of say 78 kilos and we look at the max gain rate per week, which is 0.5%. You do the multiplications, there will be about 375 grams per week of uh, weight gain. And obviously, if you look at 12 weeks, you multiply uh, 375 grams times 12 weeks, that will give you 4.5 uh, kg over a, a course of 12 weeks. The projected weight gain will be 79.5 kilos after 12 weeks. And we also want to look at the percentage gain in total. So if you take 4.5 kilo divided by 75, that will give you about 6% since the start. So as I mentioned, uh, there will be limits of about 10%, whether it's beginners to intermediate. This one is 6%, for example. So the next example would be for advanced, uh, for advanced trainee. The numbers remain the same, but because it's 0.25%, we take the lower end of that number. That will be about close to 200 gram of uh, weight gain per week. Multiply by 12 weeks, that's about 2.25 kg. So the projected weight gain will be about 77 kilos at the end of this uh, gain phase. And if you look at the percentage total in gain, it's about 3%. So as I mentioned, this will be the minimum of 3% body weight at the end of the phase. 
And obviously, this is an advanced training. So for advanced people, do not expect to make a lot of uh, or progress a lot in gaining muscle because they're really maximizing as much as they can already at that point of time. Uh, also, in short, newbies, if you're new to training, this is your chance to maximize your muscle gain because you don't get that opportunity next time, right? So with that, I understand some of you have already been in your bulking phase and you know you find it hard to hit your macros or hit your total calories for the day. So the, the previous um, nutrition talk where we had on losing weight, whatever strategies we have here will be the opposite of that, right? So obviously, if you need to hit 3,000 calories, for example, for Myron or myself, you wouldn't want to eat that in just two meals or even one meal. If one meal of 3,000 calories, you're going to starve yourself with a lot of food. That's going to be a lot of volume of food in one meal. So with that said, you want to consider having three or more meals so they can spread out the amount of calories that you need to eat in one or uh, in, in the day rather than you know just eating 3,000 calories in one sitting. Also, you can consider having liquid meals or snacks. So obviously, your protein shake will help with that. Snacks, this is the time where you can eat your fats, you can eat your nuts, you can eat your avocados. Those will help to give you a lot of calories quickly. So you can consider having them. So, so we can also bundle. So what you can do is to take your liquid meals after solid meals. So for example, after, for me, after I eat my Teochew meal, uh, I will take my protein shake after that. So let's say after a good 800 calories from Teochew porridge area, I will take maybe two shakes of protein. That will give me about 250 more calories. So about 1,000, 1,050 calories. And what you can also do after that is to eat your carbs first because your carbs won't get you as full. Then you eat your fibers. Then you eat your protein last. That might not be the best in terms of taste, but if you want to optimize and see how much food you can get in, you can consider doing that uh, following this order. Okay, and with that, we will take a, a two minutes break and uh, Myron will take over with the hypertrophy bit later, the training portion. All right, so I'm going to present on hypertrophy. Uh, just before I present, again, it's going to be, uh, as the slides go by, it's going to be a little bit more intense in terms of the structure of things, uh, especially the science bit, but I will try to keep it simple. Um, so let's talk about why is hypertrophy important, even though if you're in a fat loss phase or for a strength phase. All right, so why fat loss? Uh, even if you're doing fat loss, why hypertrophy is important is because, uh, okay, again, I want to make it clear that I'm not saying that uh, we are using hypertrophy methods for fat loss. What I'm trying to say is that why is it that you need to go into a hypertrophy phase? It's because it increases your potential for metabolic stimulus. So I'm going to give you an example, like what you can read from the screen. <clears throat> when you have more muscle mass, you have the ability to burn through much more ATP, which is your energy currency at a faster rate. And when you do that, you can stimulate your AMPK faster and it's easier for you to burn through the fatty acids and glucose, right? Uh, I'm going to explain more on that after I expound on point number two, which is uh, with more muscle mass, the chances of you having a higher BMR also increases. Okay, so higher BMR, what that means is that even just by sitting down and not doing anything, your body requires more calories to do the simple things. BMR is your basal metabolic rate. It's the number that you see when you take your in-body measurement, um, and you can see that number on the right side. It's usually 1,000 plus or 2,000 plus, right? Uh, now, let me just uh, talk more about this whole metabolic stimulus. So I'm going to take the example of myself, and let's say I'm going to put myself beside Elaine, for example, right? So if both of us are going to be on an AMPK program, and some of you are familiar with that, both of us are going to be on an AMPK program, and she's going to use... 10 kgs for her AMPK dumbbell bench press. I'm going to use 30 kgs for my AMPK dumbbell bench press. Both of us are going to do eight sets of eight. Who's going to burn more calories? And who's going to create much more of a metabolic stimulus? All right, it's definitely going to be me. In fact, because I am burning through so much more, 
with so much more tissues that I have, and with each tissue or with each cell, it creates um, metabolic waste. With so, with each repetition that I do, I'm a, my ability to burn through my ATP is so much more because I need I need so much more energy to lift that thirty kilograms even for that one rep compared to her uh, ten kgs, right? Um, so in that sense, I'm actually my program doesn't even need to be an eight by eight. So you may see people on AMPK program with six by six people who are really really strong. They need to be. They can even be on a six by six because I can create the same amount of metabolic stimulus as someone on a six by ten program, right? So with more muscle mass, the lesser you got to do. And training again, like what I said from last time round, it's all about doing the least that you possibly need to get as much results that you can. Now, for the next one, for strength, hypertrophy is extremely important for strength because what strength equates to, it's basically how much of a cross-sectional area that you have multiplied by your neural connections. The neural connections is basically from your central nervous system um, and then it attaches or the synapses and all that towards uh, your, mus your muscle fiber, your motor units and stuff like that. Right? You cannot change the number of neural connections you have you can increase its efficiency, but what you can do is to try and train for a bigger cross-sectional area. And that, what that means is basically having more muscle mass. So if you really want to be strong, maximize your strength potential, it really is about increasing your muscle mass and then have specific training for your neural connections. And that's how you get absolute strength. Now I'm going to talk about what are the main types of hypertrophy. But first off, we need to understand uh, what's on the left. On the left, it's your myofibril. Basically, your myofibril is uh, a muscle, right? It's like a strand. Um, and inside this whole circle is basically your sarcoplasm. Um, and, and this inside this whole, this, this myofibril is like one strand. It's like, think of it as a cable wire. So in this, in this cable wire, let me see. There you go. <laughs> Comes all these strands, these are your myofibrils, <laughs> all right? Okay, now, once you understand this, then we can understand the three types of hypertrophy. The first one is sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. So what sarcoplasmic hypertrophy really means is the expansion of the sarcoplasm, all right? It doesn't expand the number of fibers, it's two, five, or four, or what you see on the screen, uh, what it does is it expands the circle around that fiber. So this isn't uh, this isn't permanent. When you're doing an AMPK program, what you're doing is actually increasing the sarcoplasm of the cell. Then you ask, well, then why are we even doing sarcoplasmic hypertrophy if it is not even permanent? Why are we doing AMPK? Why are we doing pump work when it's not even increasing the number of fibers that we have? I'll explain later. First, then next up, we're going to talk about myofibrillar hypertrophy. Now, myofibrillar hypertrophy is much more permanent. It really increases the number of myofibrils that you have. So instead of four, you can see there's multiple myofibrils that are happening. And usually myofibrillar hypertrophy happens when there is tension and there's damage. And when there's damage, there's repair. And with repair comes much more growth in your myofibrillar. Basically, your fibrils will grow, right, in, uh, in terms of quantity and size. And then there is the third kind of hypertrophy called the myonuclear hypertrophy. This is permanent. The myonuclear hypertrophy is permanent. So I'm sure you've heard of uh, things like people say, uh, what this is called? Uh, so in terms of Correct. Muscle memory is basically myonuclear hypertrophy. So let me give you an example of myself. It took me four to five years to get to a strength level where I was when I was competing. And then, um, of course, an accident happened. And then uh, because of the accident, I went into racing and then I lost almost all my muscles in my body from 96 kilograms. I dropped down to 69 kilograms. I was really, really weak. But it took me about two years to get back to the strength level where I was, it was actually less than half the time that I got back to where I was. So people in layman terms would describe this as muscle memory, but it isn't what actually happened over there was myonuclear hypertrophy. Um, I'll explain in the later slides what this actually means. It's basically the duplication 
or the increase in the number of nucleus. And the nucleus comes from, it's like an egg yolk, right? So you have an egg, the egg white and the egg yolk. The egg yolk is the nucleus and the whole egg is basically the muscle cell. When your myonucleus have increased to a certain number, let's say it is put at 100, it will not decrease. And that's why the longer your training age, even if you stop, it's much more easier for you to come back than for someone who trained for a year and then stop. Yeah, because you have much more nucleus. Okay, now uh, I'm going to talk about sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. I'm going back to that. So let's, why is it that we're doing things like AMPK and stuff like that? Now, when you do hypertrophy work, Basically, what you are telling your body, it's I need a calorie. Uh, I need to go and I need to use this amount of calories to do my breaking down and repairing of tissue. But what the body doesn't want, or what it perceives as a bigger threat than to build tissue, is basically the need for energy homeostasis. Right, that's all it cares about. It means it wants a balance. But what the sarcoplasmic hypertrophy like AMPK work does is that it expands this whole um, space. And by doing that, you're taking in a lot more very specific protein. And this protein is called the sarcoplasmic protein and it helps for rapid ATP production. Right? So what this does is that now the body can then tell itself, okay, now I have, because of this, I can now uh, have much more ATP produced rapidly, much more energy currency produced rapidly. I don't perceive this as a threat anymore. And now I can focus on tension and the rebuilding of fibers. So again, I'm going to briefly uh, reiterate the whole point of EMPK is to increase the sarcoplasmic proteins for the rapid production of your energy currency, the ATP. Increase the glycogen content so that you can go for longer and harder in your hypertrophy phase or strength phase. And at the same time, it does what it's called the mitochondria uh, biogenesis, right? It helps in the mitochondrial proliferation, much more mitochondria is being built up. So there's an efficiency in terms of your training. You can recover faster, you can do more volume. And that's the whole point of why we are doing things like AMPK or cyclopasmic hypertrophy or hyperbolic training that some of you are on. Okay. Um, and then from there, when we go into a myofibrillar kind of program, which is other forms of hypertrophy, uh, you can reap the benefits from the AMPK. Okay, I'm going to move on. I am going to try my best to keep this as simple as possible. Um, everyone knows what protein synthesis is in short, but uh, you don't really actually know until you try and look up on what protein synthesis really is. It's really a very, very complicated process, as you can see from the diagram. Um, I'm going to say one thing in short. It has been shown that training has the ability to change your DNA, right? So do not underestimate uh, what you do to your body and the amount of things that you do to your body because everything that you do to your body is called a training stimulus. When they say exercise is medicine, it truly is medicine, right? Um, so you want to be aware of what actually you're doing to your body because if um, you're just going to do like, I don't know, like all kinds of things being thrown into the same program, you're doing crazy eccentrics, a lot of reps, uh, tons of reps, you're doing three hours of training, four hours, different, different kinds of activities. The body really, it's like, what are you trying to do to me? All right, because you really have the ability to alter your DNA. Now, so with regards to protein synthesis, before protein synthesis actually happens, um, there is this thing which I'll cover later. It's called the MTOR, the mTOR. When you talk about hypertrophy, uh, all you need to know is AMPK and mTOR. In, in short, you don't really have to know this, but AMPK, it's called the adenosine monophosphate kinase. mTOR is called the, the mechanistic rapamyosin-targeted myosin. The mechanistic targeted rapamyosin. Okay, that's mTOR. All right, these two are conflicting. When you are training, it's about increasing your AMPK. It is not about mTOR, but when you are done training, it's all about increasing your mTOR if you're talking about hypertrophy. The uh, thing is, um, that's why we don't want people to take protein shakes or uh, EAAs during their training because what exactly are you trying to do? If you understand why you're taking EAAs and protein shake, 
that's to increase your mTOR. But when you're training, you're trying to drive AMPK, not trying to drive mTOR. So whatever things in the advertisement uh, and, and stuff that tells you when you look at pro bodybuilders and, and athletes that saying that you should take EAAs during your training, it is not the truth. Now, this is the truth, all right? Don't do that. We would rather you take carbohydrates during training, during hypertrophy than protein during your hypertrophy, okay? So for mTOR to activate, two things must happen. Number one, you must be in a calorie surplus, like what Chris was saying. You must be in a calorie surplus. If you don't, um, I'll explain in the next slide what's going to happen. Uh, so that's point number one. Point number two, you need a sufficient amount of tension on your muscle fibers for your mTOR to be activated. All right? uh, so these two things are needed. And then what happens, there's going to be a duplication of part of your DNA and this will be then now called the mRNA. Again, you don't have to know this, but the mRNA is basically your messaging ribonucleic acid. Um, I'll explain uh, more on this data. The main thing that you need to know is that if you look at the diagram, the mRNA will then come out of the nucleus and it will be attached to this thing called the ribosomes. You will need to know what ribosomes is. Um, I'm going to just briefly describe really shortly in scientific terms and then I'm going to put a, a really easy analogy to understand. Right. Once it is attached to your ribosomes, the tRNA, which is your transporter ribonucleic acid, will then take your individual amino acids and attach itself also to the ribosomes. And you can see the three things that the tRNA is carrying. It will find the three compatible things to attach itself to. And when it attaches, there's this thing called, you can see the growing protein chain. Now it's a string of amino acids. And now that is your polypeptide and the polypeptide will then be converted to a strand of protein and that is protein synthesis it's an extremely complicated process so this is one of the easier diagrams i've found after two hours of trying to search uh, but okay now in short layman terms right all you need to know is the nucleus it holds the instructions to your job right so example the nucleus hold the instructions to your job let's say um a shipping line right it has instructions okay this is the job right and then your ribosomes are basically your workers right now you have a job you have workers and then your energy or your calorie surplus and your amino acids is your resources the workers need to have a job from the nucleus and your dna now it has this job it needs resources and then now it takes the resources which is your amino acids as well as your calorie surplus, because with this calorie surplus comes your ATP, right? Your energy currency comes from your food. And now it has the resources of your food and your amino acids. Now it takes it in with the resources, the, the workers will then take these resources with the instruction and it comes up with a, the end product, right? So in short, that is what it means. This is what, how protein synthesis works. So let's move on to the next slide. On the mTOR, the nuclei, the ribosomes, and the ATP. So that's why I mentioned that it's important to know what these are, because for mTOR to be activated, again, two things are needed, uh, an energy surplus, as well as tension on your fibers, which means it needs to be heavy enough, all right? Um, enough volume and stuff like that. Um, then your mTOR will be activated. So now you know what's mTOR, then now it's the nuclei. Your nuclei, what I mentioned, is your job or your instructions from the mRNA or the duplication of your DNA, right? The ribosomes are your workers. Um, they uh, basically help the rate of protein synthesis. And again, your resources are your ATP and amino acids, the building materials, right? Um, I'm going to briefly describe on this. So give me a second. Okay. Now, um, all right, let's talk about factors that inhibit the protein synthesis. Now, inflammation. Inflammation happens because of stress, and also it happens because of lack of sleep. Uh, it happens because you're, you're allergic to certain foods, and also it happens because you're trained to failure uh, very, very often. So when you're extremely sore, I guess this is a question that you guys have. Yeah, I trained yesterday, but I'm not sore today. Uh, am I not working out hard enough? The thing is, if you're sore, a little bit sore, it's good. But if you're too sore, like uh, if Chris has told you his story of his two weeks of bicep inflammation, then that is not good. 
because when you're inflamed, as you can see, uh, it basically blocks off your nutrition partitioning, all right? Uh, which means your cell, the, even though you have like, for example, spiked insulin, the insulin cannot attach to that um, glucose, all right? Because uh, when you have inflammation, it almost creates this kind of a shield where nothing can pass through that cell. So you don't want to train to failure often at the very most to the very last set. And that's why we always mention 8RPE, 1RIR, and never 10RPE or 0RIR unless it is the very last set. Okay. The next thing that affects your protein synthesis is low ATP. Uh, well, with low ATP, again, because you don't have the resources to go through hypertrophy. When you are low in ATP, basically you will be high in AMPK. And remember what I talked about AMPK and mTOR, they are conflicting. When you are low on ATP because you are eating very little, there is no way you are going to activate your mTOR because one of the two factors is gone. When you are low in carbohydrates, so then comes the question, can I grow muscle by um, being on a keto diet or low carb? You cannot. Reason being because with a glow of glycogen, it activates your AMPK as well, right? Unless you are on something that's of a, a neuroendocrine kind of program, like the high threshold program, uh, it is very, very hard to turn on your mTOR. And carbohydrates or rather glucose, some glucose is needed to form your ribosomes. Ribose comes from sugar and basically your ribosomes are, uh, you need some form of glucose for it, right? And again, if you don't have enough, uh, there's this whole process called the gluconeogenesis, which is extremely stressful to your body and is going to cause inflammation. So you do need some cups for your training in hypertrophy. And last but not least, again, because low amino acids, uh, again, is one of your building blocks. Your amino acids and ATP are your resources for hypertrophy. I'm going to go back to the factors for protein synthesis again. In terms of the nuclei, remember I talked about one of the hypertrophy methods is myonuclear. Basically, this whole thing about nucleus, it's um, the more nucleus you have, the more instructions you have for your workers, the ribosomes, to do its job, which means you can increase protein synthesis. And when we talk about myonuclear training, it's all about oxidation. It's all about soreness, failure, inflammation. Yes, I did say that inflammation is not good, but some inflammation is needed for hypertrophy because what it does, it does this thing called it signals the satellite cells. And satellite cells, if you think about it, it's like Earth, right? Earth is a muscle cell and then there's mass. What satellite signaling means is that the Earth would then, or rather mass would consume or donate, sorry, mass would donate its nuclei and ribosomes to Earth so that you have much more instructions and much more protein synthesis that can happen, right? This can only be done uh, with some form of damage. But how hypertrophy training is, is about this is damage. You need to be like very, very close to it, right? Almost like touching it a little bit, but not going beyond it. Once in a while, you do see people on oxidative programs, and that is really to destroy you, right? So that we can have as much nuclei donations as possible. But very rarely you see it, maybe twice a year kind of thing. Okay, now... Um, I'm going to go on to the most crucial ingredient for hypertrophy. And that is tension. Tension is truly the number one key to hypertrophy. Um, and to have sufficient tension, it is your load along with your volume, along with your intent. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Load means, yes, uh, basically means the weight, the intensity of the, the weight that you're lifting, but also it means um, how, do you, how does each fiber kind of feel? You can even increase the load or the intensity in terms by using eccentrics. You can use it in terms of isometric holes at certain pauses in the, like a pause squat, for example, right? When you do this, you increase the tension and with more load, much more tension be felt across the Z line. So programs like high threshold, extremely heavy five RMs and stuff like that, uh, it increases a lot of tension and lots of tension can be felt across the Z-line, which activates this whole recovery inflammation process, right? Next up is your volume. So sufficient volume is needed. And that's why uh, you find that you, we need like a certain amount of sets because that is shared between the coaches. You need a certain amount of sets 
with a sufficient, and so take note I wrote there, sufficient, significant tension. That's why you cannot use a load that is too light. When you use a load that's too light, nothing is going to happen. Right? You can do this, you pick a load and you do three sets of 20 or 30 or 40 reps. Nothing is going to happen, right? I'm sure you've been to some places where you have to use one kg weights and you do triceps extension and stuff like that. All you feel is the burn, but to be honest, all you feel is the burn. That's all. Nothing is going to happen because there's no significant tension when you're doing it, right? So that's why you usually say seven to eight RPE because we need that volume of significant tension. Last but not least is actually the most important thing that I would take note is the intent because we have prescribed the load and the volume. The intent is what I see that's, that's missing in terms of people's programming, right? When we talk about intent, we talk about different contraction types. So that's why you have like say incline bench presses, flat bench and stuff because we want to hit the muscle across the different strength curve for the full intention of creating uh, tension across the Z lines. But also, let's talk about a bicep curl. So sometimes when some of you are doing bicep curls, you notice that you'll put our hands behind your back. And if you actually fall forward, it means that you're using a stabilizers of the shoulder to do its job rather than the elbow flexors to do its job. Doesn't mean, okay, this thing I always see the most, everyone's favorite exercise, the Bulgarian squat. A lot of people are just doing the Bulgarian squat for the sake of doing the Bulgarian squat, right? You're not going low. You're not stretching your hamstrings and glutes. You're just pulsing up and down, but that does nothing. So what if you can use 32 kgs for Bulgarian squats when the intent isn't for you to stretch your glutes and hamstrings and that was supposed to be the true intention of the exercise, right? You need, when you squat, it's not about going up and down with a heavy load. Your muscles doesn't recognize whether it's 10 kilograms or 100 kilograms. What your body recognizes is the tension on each individual fiber that is being felt if with each repetition, right? When you squat, you need to feel from your rectus femoris, right from your hip joint all the way to your knee, every fiber contracting and stretching from the bottom to the top of the squat. When you do your bicep curls, all you should feel is your biceps and not your shoulders. When you're doing your chest, all you should feel is your chest and not your anterior deltoids and stuff like that. So it's so crucial. I mean, uh, I, mean I don't know why, but Sophie comes to mind when we talk about intent. Uh, today, she was just saying to someone, you know, the intention of training is so important. And I didn't realize how important it was because last time I was just doing, I was just zombified and I'm just following the instructions, just doing it for the sake of doing it. But now when I truly understand the intent of each contraction have i seen my body start to change and here's someone who has been with uh, 34 percent body fat and as of today she's at 22 percent body fat so she definitely knows what it takes so do not underestimate what intent will do to your body because it has the power to change your dna it's a tension on each fiber not the weight all right, now I'm going to move on to the supplementation for hypertrophy. Um, creatine is extremely good for uh, your strength phase or just hypertrophy in general because, again, what creatine does is that increases your temporary. It's like a credit card. It loans you more ATP for the time being to execute at a higher intensity for slightly longer duration of time so you can get that one or two more reps in. Imagine you're doing that for eight sets. That's 16 more reps in a session, multiplied by two in a week, multiplied by 12 weeks. That's a lot of work done, right? Um, so it's great when you're in any forms of hypertrophy program. Um, citrulline malate, this can be found in products like the Enos. Basically, what that does is that it helps with vessel dilation. Uh, great for things when you're doing like sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, AMPK, or hypertrophy 2.0, 3.0 kind of program. Higher repetitions, shorter rest. Uh, what this does is that it helps to, in a way, sort of buffer a bit of the um, hydrogen ions and lactate, but also provide you with um, nutrition or nutrients partitioning into the muscles that you're working. Uh, amino acids, this lately uh, this the building blocks again because you in, to act activate mTOR, you need any of this uh, for training, especially this thing called the leucine. 
or the isoleucine, which can be found in all your BCA amino acids and protein isolate. Uh, what this does is that it, the leucine really helps to activate your mTOR. Uh, give me a second. Let me just check. Uh, give me a second. Can I, you guys can hear me, right? Because my battery says it's low. Uh, someone can just type something. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thanks, still. All right. Uh, next up is HMB. Basically, HMB is an, an, another form of uh, amino acid which can be found in products like MyoPrime. Uh, in a way, it is like leucine, but it is a little bit more powerful than that. If you want any more information, just feel free to ask us what HMB is. Um, and last but not least, fish oil. Fish oil is needed in whatever phases that you're doing. It's even needed if you're not training because, again, what fish oil does, it helps with cellular communication, especially if you're in a fat loss phase. or in your, Especially if you're in a hypertrophy phase, what fish oil does is that it helps to cut the inflammation process. Right? Omega-3 and omega-6, they are not the same. Omega-6 helps the whole... In, actually, omega-6 starts the inflammatory process, which is what you want. But omega-3... Omega helps to curb the inflammation process. So you need to be careful with the amounts of omega-3 and omega-6 that you're taking. Both of them are important, but uh, the concentration is extremely important. Again, uh, just to reiterate, you need about 3 grams, 2 to 3 grams of EPA plus DHA at a 2 to 1 ratio. Uh, so far, I've yet to find another stronger, I mean, I can't find any stronger ones than our, our omega omega-3 triglycerides. So uh, yeah, if you do find any, please let us know. Okay, I'm almost done. Actually, this is the last slide. And I'm going to talk about the common misconceptions of hypertrophy. I'm sure it will interest some of you. Will lifting heavy makes me put on muscle fast? Uh, studies have shown whether you do three sets of 10 or 10 sets of three, it will produce the same or identical amount of muscle mass gain. So no, lifting heavy won't make you put on muscle mass faster than lifting lighter, right? It's all about tension. Three sets of 10 produces tension towards the end. 10 sets of three produces tensions at the start. So it's the same thing. Uh, I have to train to failure. Uh, point number two, I have to train to failure in order for muscle gains. I guess if you've been from a commercial gym, you always see people doing drop sets or just training to failure set after set after set. No, you don't have to train to failure because if you keep doing that, Yes, you'll see people like newbies, they start to grow and all that stuff. But towards the end, they're just going to stay stagnant for years and years to come. Just because they have just destroyed their muscle. You're basically doing a two steps forward, one and a half step back. Right? So what's the point? The, the more volume I do, point number three, the more volume I do, the better. And that's why some people are in the gym training. I do know of people in the gym who train legs three for three hours. But like seriously, what's the point? Right? Uh, it's not about how much volume you do, it is how much significant tension there is on each individual fiber that's going to change your DNA. Remember, every repetition counts. Right. Point number four, I can dirty bulk. Right. Some of you, I think I was just talking to you about this, you said you were dirty bulking when you were on a hypertrophy phase. Um, no, you don't want a dirty bulk because then you'd be like, but then it's calories, what? Uh, that's not the point. The whole point, if you're going to eat shit, right, you're going to cause a lot of inflammation in your body. So why even bother when your body can't even absorb uh, this whole thing? So the whole reason why you, when you dirty bulk and you get really fat and you have a lot of acne and stuff is because the body, the liver cannot accept the kind of food you're having. So please do not dirty bulk. Point number five, I will become big and bulky easily. Now, it's again, it's not about the training only. It's really about what you eat. Even if you lift really heavy and you fit yourself on maintenance calories, you won't really put on much muscle, right? It's about calorie surplus along with your training stimulus. So no, it's not so easy. I wish it was. Um, point number six, I have to stick to eight to 12 reps for hypertrophy or more than 12 for cutting or one to three for strength. You always hear that, right? If you want to cut, you got to do high reps. Oh, man, the uh, HO analogy. Or you want, to, you want to be strong and have to lift one to three reps. That's not true. Before what I was uh, doing, uh, Chris as well, before we started doing our current program, we were on AMPK, we were doing this 64 reps. And um, did, it, did it make us stronger for this phase? Oh yeah, hell yeah, it did, right? So that's not true. Um, there's no such thing as a hypertrophy range. Uh, again, it's all about the amount, the total amount of tension that's placed on your muscle. And again, 
when if you're in a mechanical damage phase, if you're in an oxidative hypertrophy phase, if you're in a high threshold phase, if you're in an AMPK phase, all of them will contribute to some form of hypertrophy. It's what kind of a stimulus of tension are you talking about? All right. Point number seven, I do not need hypertrophy for fat loss. I think I've answered that. So just again, with more muscle mass, you'll higher your BMR. And it is not the muscle mass that makes you look big now. It's the food that you're eating that's making you look big now, right? It's the fat that's being piled onto your muscle, right? So whatever that you cannot pinch when you flex, that's fat. So take note what's actually fat and what's muscle, all right? Okay, now, uh, point number eight, I can hypertrophy and fat loss at the same time. What this is actually, this is called a body recomposition. Some of you that are doing your current program, you are actually facing that, right? You are doing, you are seeing like you are putting on muscle mass at the same time you're losing fat. Uh, yes, you can do a body recon, but I'll just say that the more you are experienced, the more advanced you are in terms of body recon, it gets very, very difficult. Uh, the more advanced you are, the more muscle tissue you have, it's really all about trying to maintain your muscle mass as much as you can during a fat loss phase, especially towards the end of the fat loss phase. All right. So yes, it's possible, but the more advanced you are, the harder it is. Um, if um, point number nine, if I eat a lot of protein, will I grow too big or become fat? Eh, if you think about it, that's the same as saying, if I'm going to eat too much fish, I'll become a fat slot. Does that make sense? Right? So no, it's not true. It doesn't mean you take one protein shake, you become fat. It's like saying I eat fish this morning, I become fat. Or if I eat my chakwe tel this morning, I become fat. Which one makes more sense, right? Protein is just a macronutrient. It's four calories, carbohydrates, four calories. That's all, right? Point number 10, my rest time cannot be too long for hypertrophy. So everyone thinks that, uh, I know you guys are pretty smart. And I mean, you guys train here, you guys actually know quite a lot, I have to say. Um, so a lot of people say, oh, you know, if I were to train in the 10 to 12 reps, I have to keep my rest time to 60 seconds. Or if I were to train for hypertrophy, I need my muscles to feel pump, right? I cannot take more than 60 seconds of rest. No, that's not true. Um, I think Chris and myself, we've been on programs where we rested 10 minutes and that's hypertrophy as well. It's not about rest times. Again, what is your training stimulus? The rest time has to coincide with your training stimulus. Point number 11, the second last point. I can convert my fat to muscle and vice versa. I can, or if I put on too much muscle uh, mass right now, I'll become fat when I stop training. That is absolutely not true, all right? Fat is fat, muscle is muscle. Muscle, no fat. It's not the same, all right? Muscle cells are muscle cells. Fat is a fatty cell itself. It's two separate different things. If you stop training, reason why you see people who are bodybuilders and they become fat is because they're probably eating the same amount or even worse and they're not even training. And that's why they're becoming fat because the BMR drops, you lose the muscle tissue and you're still eating the same amount of calories and probably more junk. And that's why they look the way they look, right? So no, it's not true. Um, and of course, uh, point number 12, um, calisthenics or barbell or dumbbell or whatever kettlebell is the way to train for hypertrophy. Um, this one is better than the other. Well, uh, tension is tension. There is no such thing as calisthenics or body weight or barbell or kettlebell. All right. So this is to you guys who are kettlebell freaks or calisthenic freaks or barbell freaks or powerlifters or whatever. It's not true. All right. It's the body doesn't recognize it's a barbell or a body weight or whatever. It's how much tension are you applying? Yes, it's true that uh, in terms of calisthenics, uh, why some people adopt so well to it is because there's so much tension, right? There's so much exertion that yes, it produces a lot of lactate metabolites and stuff like that, which may contribute to hypertrophy. But if you train really well with um, dumbbells, um, it does cause a lot of hypertrophy as well. So don't let... Um, whatever you see on social media say that uh, this is better than that or that is better than this, it isn't, right? It's how you use it. I, I, like, I think I was telling someone yesterday, I know of this guy who won a bodybuilding championships training with 10 kg dumbbells, all right? It's insane. But the amount of intent that he put into that training is insane. Uh, I don't like to use myself as an example, but I'm just going to say it. 
when I was uh, competing in bodybuilding, I was known as Quadzilla. So if you actually go and Google me on the Hardware Zone forums, I'm known as Quadzilla and stuff like that, right? But well, that's, that's besides the point. Um, what I'm trying to say is, all I did was squats, like squats, leg extension, or maybe walking lunges once in a while. And I just did three to four sets. That was all once a week. And my quads, so my legs grew to 27 inches each. Was it the number of exercises I did or a specific kind of training? No, it wasn't. It was with each rep. I ensured it was contracted to its maximal ability. All right. So, yep. I'm pretty much done. So, if you guys have any questions, um, let us know. Okay. So, Jean. Uh, Jean, your question is uh, when, is, when the is the right time to eat? If you're truly, really talking about hypertrophy, break down your muscles as hard as you can, get into AMPK during your training. Uh, but the minute you're done training, down-regulate as fast as possible. So I usually recommend drinking uh, close to 500 ml of water to just down-regulate your whole body, bring your blood pressure down. Wait for about 10 minutes or so. And then um, try and consume a whey protein isolate, spike your insulin so that your whole cortisol levels and stuff will start to dip, uh, get into recovery as fast as possible. So this is not like a fat loss phase that you guys are doing. Uh, consume your food pretty soon. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be right immediately or, you know, uh, man, some of you, you know, I came across uh, examples where people spill their protein powder, right? And then you guys will be like, oh, shit, my gains, right? <laughs> Uh, um, no, 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 don't worry about that, okay? Uh, it doesn't work that way. Consume as soon as you can, but also this depends on what you have in your previous meal. If you have beef, um, then you don't have to worry too much because if you have beef two hours prior before your training, uh, beef takes about six hours to digest fully. So you can even wait like maybe an hour after training. But if you had eggs like two hours before training and you train really hard, probably you want to consume something as whey protein isolate before your training consume as soon as you can because whey protein isolate breaks down at a rate of 10 grams per hour so by the time you're done training you're probably done really with the protein in your body right so this depends on what have you eaten prior to this um yeah pretty much that's all i think the uh i covered every question uh, at the back and if you guys have any more questions just feel free to ask us in face to face and um, don't be afraid to question us because if we can answer, we will. Uh, if we can't, we will always research for you. Otherwise, thank you guys for joining us. <laughs> and we'll see you on the next one.